Our main theme tonight is life elsewhere. But first, some news notes and one very interesting discovery. A large body on the outskirts of the solar system, provisionally named Xena. Is it a planet or isn't it? Well, I wonder. Let's say what we know about this body first. It's about twice as far from the Sun as Pluto is, and it's large, definitely larger than Pluto, probably about 2,000 miles across. And it takes more than 500 years to go around the Sun. Absolutely. We're in the outer reaches of the solar system here. Now, is it a planet? It's been reported as the 10th planet. Well, if Pluto's a planet, this one must be. It's larger, so it must qualify. But is Pluto a planet, Patrick? Well, I used to think so. Now, frankly, I don't. Because after all, there are many other bodies of large bodies, not so big as Pluto, but this is a new one. I'm sure there are plenty more. They are members of what we call the Kuiper Belt, a whole band of these things. Mm. And i rather reluctant to say that I think that Pluto and this new body, Xena, are merely the largest known members of the Kuiper Belt. Yes, and many more are known. For example, Sedna was discovered a few years ago and is Pluto-sized. And quite remarkably, we had two other discoveries this month, both of objects almost as large as Pluto. So we're beginning to flesh out what we know about the population of this remote asteroid belt. <laughs> and of course, coming in, more mysteries concerning satellites. In the Saturn system, the second of the known satellites we know for a long time is Enceladus, a small world. And it appears to be icy, and there now seem to be an atmosphere and possibly ice volcanoes. Yes, aren't these images amazing? They're from the Cassini spacecraft, which flew just a hundred miles above the surface of Enceladus. And these are the first images from that flyby, and there are more to come. It's tiny with a very, very low gravitational pull, so this is a real surprise. Mm, and absolutely. coming in, of course, more and more about Mars. And this lovely picture of an ice lake and the Vastitas Borealis, the northern wilderness of Mars. That's an amazing picture. Yes, it's from the Mars Express spacecraft of the European Space Agency. Why is it interesting? Well, we've always known there's ice at the polar caps of Mars. We see those in a small telescope. Although it's 70 degrees north, it's not quite as oh, far no, as the not. polar caps. No, I'm So sure. we see water on Mars now, and it's waiting there on the surface. Useful, certainly useful for any future colonists, I would think. There's no shortage of ice upon Mars. Well, we've been talking about planets in our own solar system, and we now know there are many other solar systems. And one very interesting discovery, a planet in a triple star system, which simply ought not to be there. No, I think that's absolutely true. It's a hot Jupiter, which orbits one of the stars in the system every three days or so. And that star's also in gravitational interactions with two other stars. It's a period of about 27 years for the double. Now, why shouldn't this planet be there? We think large planets like this one form reasonably far out in the solar, in and solar systems. And then migrate inwards. And then migrate inwards. Now, if this planet had done exactly. that, it would have been disrupted by the gravity of the other stars that make up the system. So it's a real mystery. Another point, too. We've never believed that planets in multiple star systems could be stable for long periods of time. They're beloved of science fiction writers. Oh, yes, indeed. But we've always written off double star, multiple star systems as possible sources of planets. Maybe now we see we've been too hasty. And we are finding more of these things all the time. Another news note, we're coming up now to the maximum of the Perseid meteor shower. The actual maximum is on the night of August 12, 13, just after midnight, but look out also the previous and following nights. Chris has been meteor watching and has some tips for us. We've come to Slindon College in the Sussex South Downs, a beautiful observing site with a view right down to the horizon. We're here for the Perseid meteor shower. The maximum's in a few days' time, on the 11th and 12th of August. But even tonight, there should be some meteors in view. I've got the clipboard, I've got my pencil and ruler, I've got my binoculars, and of course, the deck chair is crucial. Meteors are the fastest moving of astronomical phenomena, and one of the least predictable. Catching an image of one is a real achievement. The very brightest can be spectacular, revealing colours or breaking up into separate parts as they enter our atmosphere. John Mason has been meteor watching for years, travelling across the world to catch the best displays. So John, we're here to observe meteors, but what is a meteor? Well, the space between the planets isn't empty. It's full of particles of interplanetary dust. And as the Earth goes round the Sun in its yearly orbit, it sweeps up those particles of dust. And as they enter the upper atmosphere at enormous speed, they burn away in the brief streak of light that we call a meteor 
or a shooting star. And we should say, despite their spectacular end, we're talking about tiny particles here. Oh, we are. I mean, most of these particles are smaller than grains of sand, but they're travelling at enormous speed, tens of kilometres per second, and something that was the size of, say, a pea would produce a very bright meteor indeed. And meteors, therefore, have nothing to do with meteorites. No, meteorites are solid fragments that survive to reach the ground and we pick them up. Meteors, tiny particles of dust, burning away high in the atmosphere, completely incinerated, and they're typically 80, 90, 100 kilometres above the ground, the meteor trails we're seeing. And there are two kinds of meteor. Yes, there are sporadic meteors, which are meteors coming from random directions that can be seen any time of the day, any time of the year. And there are shower meteors. And the meteor showers are mainly connected with periodic comets. Now, as comets go around the sun, they uh, emit dust and gas, and they leave dusty trails behind them along the orbit of the comet. And if the Earth happens to pass through or close to one of those dusty trails, the dust from the comet is drawn into the Earth's atmosphere, producing a meteor shower. And all the meteors from the particular shower will tend to radiate out from one particular part of the sky. It's like standing above a straight motorway and looking back along the road. All the white lines seem to come from a single point, which would be the radiant, even though we know they don't actually meet. That's right. The white lines are diverging from the vanishing point on the horizon. In the same way, all the meteors of a particular shower appear to diverge from one point in the sky, again due to the effect of perspective, and that is the radiant. And we name a meteor shower after the constellation in which the radiant lies. So one example is Comet Swift Tuttle, which had its last close passage to the sun, what, 10 years ago now? 1992 it was. And that's comets associated with the Perseid shower, which we're observing tonight. That's right. The uh, comet Swift Tuttle goes around the sun every 130 years, but whether the comet is near or not is irrelevant because the dust is spread all the way around the comet, and so every year, in about the second week of August, as the Earth crosses the orbit of the comet, the dust particles from Swift Tuttle are drawn into the atmosphere and they appear to radiate out from the constellation of Perseus. This year, because the actual peak is sort of around the middle of the day on the 12th, we expect to see roughly equal numbers on the night of the 11th, 12th, and the night of the 12th, 13th. And of course, the moon is out the way this year. That's the marvellous thing. The moon can be a blessed nuisance because its light will drown out all but the brightest members of the shower. This year, the moon is setting well before midnight, and so you'll be able to observe from midnight onwards in a clear, dark sky. Hopefully clear, in any case. Well, we've got the clear sky tonight. Let's we hope we see have. some meteors. We've been joined by experienced and some new observers and we've arranged ourselves into a wagon wheel formation to monitor the whole sky between us. I'm looking almost due east towards the rising radiant. Just as it was starting to get dark, we saw one of the most spectacular meteors I've ever seen, breaking up as it went and easily brighter than Venus. Typically, I was still setting up my camera, so there are no images. As night descends, it's important to let your eyes get adjusted to the darkness. It takes about 20 minutes to become fully dark adapted. So we're using a night vision camera so that we can observe the sky without being disturbed. It's always worth going out early on in the evening because you never quite know what you're going to see. Witness that beautiful fireball mm, we saw earlier lovely. on. But as far as the Perseids are concerned, the radiant is very low down early on. And really it's from midnight onwards as the radiant climbs into the northeast and east that the rates pick up. And uh, in the pre-dawn hours, that's when you're going to get the highest rates. So from midnight till dawn, that's the best time to go out. So have we had any luck yet? No, I've only seen the bright one earlier Oh, but on. the bright one was yes, spectacular. Know, we have to credit that. Yeah, but haven't seen anything since. <laughs> and yeah, we've got a satellite here moving down towards uh, Deneb. We're going to miss to the north of Deneb. It's just above Cepheus at the moment. It's quite fast moving. We've already seen uh, one or two satellites already, and uh, I'm sure there's going to be mo much, many more as the sky gets darker. Celestial vermin. Well, you might call them that, but uh, they, they, they fill the dull moments in between the meteors, so it's always something to look at. And what area of the sky are you looking at? Um, basically, I have Vega directly overhead and um, everything underneath what, it. summer triangle? Yeah, summer triangle. You said you got into astronomy as a, as a kid by meteor watching. I'm afraid it was, yes. Ten years old, hanging out my bedroom window, looking at, looking hopefully for for fireworks um, around November the 5th and then over overhead in the sky was one 
bright meteor. Didn't look anything like a firework. It was kind of a single, very bright light, greenish tinge breaking apart as it went, went along. A real fireball. I'd like to believe so, yes. Seeing my first meteor when I was 10 years old meant I actually went out, got my first book of astronomy, sun lounger in the back garden, Parker with a snorkel up because it starts mm -hmm. getting cold that time of year. And you watch for meteors and you learn the constellations when you're there. As yeah, well. it's a great way to learn the sky, just spending it time is. looking up and watching them rotate actually if you're out here for, for long enough. If you're patient, you have the time and you're warm enough, oh, then you can always see oh, something. Oh, that's the second one of the night. Where was it, no, John? That was, uh, that was a sporadic and yeah. it was going from um, midway between Lyra and Cygnus, heading towards the bottom of Cepheus. So John, we've turned away from meteor observing briefly to catch something else, an iridium flare. Yes, this is um, irid an iridium flare is produced because there's a whole uh, group of satellites up there, the iridium satellites. There were 66 of them all together, which were designed to help us fix positions very accurately on the surface of the Earth. And of course, although it's dark down here, the sun is still shining up at the height of the orbit of the satellite. And as the solar panels of the satellite turn towards us, there is a brief bright flash of light. About a minute to go to a maximum brightness. And the first thing we're looking for is a faint satellite trail, which will then suddenly brighten just for what? But only for a few seconds. You said three seconds or so. Yeah, that's right. 10.57. Also, this illustrates the importance of having checked your watch before, before coming out to the middle of nowhere. Oh, there's go. Yeah, there's a. There uh, it is. Higher up. Across. Higher up. There it is. So I can see it moving. There it is. It's higher brightening up. Brightening now. Brightening, brightening, brightening. There's the flare. Coming up to maximum brightness. Not as bright as down. Jupiter by any means. No. And now fading away. Oh dear, what a disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> it's half an hour past midnight and things are really beginning to pick up. We've just seen two really nice bright meteors and one of them was our first Perseid. It streaked across the bottom of Cygnus towards the constellation of Delphinus and we were able to trace the track back to Perseus. And I think it was seen by almost all of us here so hopefully we'll get a few more. Vega, Deneb and Altair, the three bright stars from three different constellations. And of course that's a good place to be looking for Perseids, John. Yes, it is. Uh, the other thing, of course, is if you're in a really dark sky site, you'll see the Milky Way flowing beautifully along the long axis of Cygnus. There are hints of it tonight. There are, from Deneb, uh, past Gamma, down towards Albario at the um, Swan's Beak. Uh, but the other reason that's good to know the orientation of Cygnus is at the peak of the Perseid shower, the Perseids streak down the neck of Cygnus, uh, parallel to the long axis of the Northern Cross, which is the other name for Cygnus. And so it's a good way of getting uh, a, your idea of direction as to whether it's a Perseid or not. And we can see Perseus in the sky now, of course. Yes, it's coming up now nicely in the northeast, uh, below the familiar W of Cassiopeia. And of course, at maximum, the radiant of the Perseid shower is very close to the lovely double cluster, the sword handle, which is between the end star of Cassiopeia, the faintest one in the W, and the top of the triangle that marks the head of Perseus. Um, and you'll see Perseids, of course, not just in that area, very short Perseids, short bright ones, you'll see near Cassiopeia. And then as you move further afield, up towards Cepheus and Cygnus and out to Pegasus, so the Perseids will become longer and a faster rate of streaking. And another good spot for photography. Absolutely. So Martin, you're not doing the same as the rest of us. What are you up to? Well, I'm basically trying to take images of meteors. The main advantage of using a digital SLR is simply that you can see what you've taken seconds after you've taken it. And the technique is really simple. The technique's simple, you just open the shutter. The biggest risk is that the lens dews up as the night gets damp, so you can take a load of pictures and find out there's nothing on there because you didn't check the lens. So how long an exposure do you use? Well, in twilight conditions, uh, you could really only get away with a few minutes at f1.4, but if it's really dark, then you could probably get away with 10, 15 minutes, far more than you could with film, because, of course, CCDs don't fog over, and once you've got the image off the camera into a computer, you can really process all the light pollution out until you get a, a really nice picture. Meteor photography can be carried out with very simple 
uh, SLR, 35mm SLR cameras that you can now buy in junk shops for about £5 because everybody's gone digital. I've got a couple of old Russian cameras fitted with 28mm um, focal length f2 lenses loaded with um, a fast colour film, a 400 or 800 ISO colour film and uh, even with an undriven camera, uh, any meteor that appears in the field of view while the camera lens is open will show up as a streak uh, on the film. And what I tend to do is get the film developed, put onto a CD, and then I also do manipulation of the pictures as the digital people do, except it's a, a much cheaper camera and a setup to use. Of course, the most famous of the periodic comets is Halley's Comet. Does that have a shower associated with it? Yes, in fact, Halley's Comet has two associated meteor showers. There's the Eta Acarids at the beginning of May, which are really best seen from places further south than here. And there's the Orionids in the third week of October, and that's very well observable from, from Britain. And of course you have the Taurids around that time of year as well. Yes, they're connected with the shortest period comet, which is Encke's Comet. And the Taurids are a very broad stream. They really go on from the middle of October almost to the middle of November. So that means the dust is really spread out in the orbit? Very much so. As showers get older, the dust gets more and more spread. We've had a good night tonight, but the real excitement will be on the maximum nights of the 11th, 12th and 12th, 13th of August, when we expect around 80 meteors an hour. Go out and enjoy the show. And if you do get any images, send them to us at Sky at Night, BBC Birmingham, Mailbox, B11RF, or email at skyatnight at bbc.co.uk. Let's hope for clear skies. And now on to our main programme. Is there life elsewhere? Is there life up there beyond the Earth? We've no evidence of it yet, but does it exist? If so, what's it going to be like? Where is it? And can we contact it? These are very important questions. And with me are two very distinguished professors, Monica Grady, and Simon Conway Morris. Delighted to see you both. Well, first of all, what is your general view, Simon? That life is common. It should be, because the building blocks of life can be made in almost any environment you care to specify, which includes deep in the ocean, that's not very surprising, but also in interstellar space. So, after all, if these chemical proceeds which are necessary to make, for example, proteins or DNA can be made in rather unexceptional circumstances, then one would imagine that actually the process of assembly should happen anywhere. That is the general idea. Over the last few years, we've learned a huge amount about life on Earth. We used to think it was um, just present on the surface, but now we know of a, a huge range of conditions where life occurs on Earth. We know that you can find it in the deepest parts of the ocean where it's very dark. We know that it lives very successfully in rocks in Antarctica. We know that it can survive and thrive in some of the hottest boiling water around uh, volcanoes and geysers, hot springs. It is in fact very adaptable and can appear in the most unexpected places. That's right. Most of the life that we're talking about though is, is very simple life and because we now know that they can appear all over the earth, perhaps if there are similar places within the solar system, yes. life might be present there as well. I think one point we must make here, we're going to deal now with life as we know it. Once you go into entirely alien life forms, you can speculate forever, and there's no point in it really. So, in the solar system, we all think of Mars. What do you think about Mars? Right, Mars is a great place to uh, look for life. It's so similar in many ways to the Earth. We do know that there is water on Mars's surface. Mars has two ice caps, one, of which, one of which is water rich. There are many suggestions now that there is uh, ice trapped in rock uh, at Mars's surface. And by analogy with the organisms we know that live in rocks in Antarctica, it's possible that similar sort of organisms might live in rocks on Mars. What's your bit? Is there any life you'll find there? I think that if we find anything, we will find that there is uh, extinct life on Mars. I don't believe that uh, there is living life on Mars. I don't even believe that there's dormant life on Mars. What about further out in the solar system? Of Jupiter's satellite Europa, with an icy surface and almost certainly an ocean underneath. 
Europa has um, a, a, a liquid ocean below an ice crust. Now, what's keeping that ocean liquid is the heat in the centre of the satellite, which is caused by Jupiter. Jupiter pulls yeah. and pushes on Europa um, because of its, its huge gravitational attraction. So that's kept Europa hot in the centre. Now, that heat has to come out somewhere. And by analogy with the Earth, where heat comes out of the uh, below the surface um, into the oceans at things called hydrothermal vents. Yes, exactly. We think perhaps there might be hydrothermal vents on Europa's ocean floor. At the base of our ocean, on the ocean floor, there are animals there which feed on bacteria, which use chemical energy rather than energy from the sun. So that could occur that. also on Europa. That could occur on Europa. You might have bacteria harvesting the chemical energy and then maybe animals living on those bacteria, a similar sort of food web. Well, I wonder. In our own solar system, we have no evidence of life elsewhere, and um, there are possibilities that are only rather vague, but we are being a bit political, aren't we? We're As being very 100,000 million stars in our galaxy, and we now know of more than 100 extrasolar planets, and there many more. So what do you think about that, Simon? Well, the potential is there. The potential is enormous. And as Monica already mentioned, the extraordinary fact is that life is far more robust than we realise. It occurs basically everywhere. So the thousand million dollar question is, first of all, does life occur elsewhere? Right. Or is it a fluke? Well, most people think it can't be because it's based on standard chemistry. And then, of course, the next question is, well, all these planets, yes, we know about many of them, but so far, the solar systems which we have detected very far from the Earth are radically different from our solar system. Now, there's a very important qualification here because these fantastic techniques which detect these remote planets, you can't actually see the planet itself. It's far too faint against the star. But there are these brilliant physical techniques which allow you to infer invisible planets. And what we can only do is infer planets of a certain size, planets which are sufficiently massive, not to get hideously technical, but they distort the starlight yes. and then allow you to estimate where they are, how fast they're rotating, and what the mass is. And once we found Earth-like planets, then we can start to target our search and say, well, can we find more about its atmosphere? And then, if it has an atmosphere, does it have what we call the biosphere? Does it have life on it? And then, of course, there's this question, well, supposing, in fact, life is almost ubiquitous, but supposing, as some Americans have argued, it stays almost in a rut. In other words, it can't get evolutionary going. So maybe intelligence is much rarer. Maybe there's something very, very special about the Earth. And the more we know about our solar system, in comparison with all these other solar systems, then yes, there may be something very strange about our Earth. Do you think our solar system also is very unusual? It's very unusual in the number of planets that we have. The, there have been several stars that have got several planets orbiting them that have been detected, but I think the biggest number that has been seen is three yes. so far. Yeah. And a lot of them, the modelling that's done in building solar systems has a certain amount of difficulty in building a solar system with uh, eight large planets in it, never mind Kuiper belt objects and asteroid belts. So we are a very unusual system. It does seem to me, though, that um, if we find life anywhere... That will show it's widespread. So far, we haven't done this. And I think you're a bit dubious, aren't you, Simon? I'm gently sceptical, but the reason is more to do with what is called the Fermi paradox. And here, of course, we're arguing that not only is there life across the universe, but there are also astronomers. And from that, we can, in fact, infer various things about what astronomers would look like. They would have to have eyes, for example, and we can, I think, show from evolution that the appearance of an eye is almost automatic. Yes. But if we have the emergence of technologies, and even on this planet, something close to a technology completely independent of humans has already evolved, then one might say, well, in the fullness of time, and of course our solar system is relatively young, Across our galaxy, and indeed the universe, other civilizations ought to have appeared. They ought to have perhaps left signals, they might have sent probes, or even perhaps visited this planet. Is that a completely silly idea? I'm sure it isn't, but after all, civilization here is not very old, and only in the last few centuries could we pick up signals. I mean, if somebody had come here um, 100 million years ago, 
they wouldn't have found those citizens. I think they would have been profoundly uh, optimistic, actually, because they would have known from their own history that there are various trajectories in the way that evolution tends to go. And they would have probably looked at their metaphorical watch and said, around about 100 million years, give or yes. take, you know. I think, but I think they're on the track to what we already have. And, of course, the fact that some solar systems are probably more than a billion years, yes, a quite. thousand million years older than our one. Once you've got technology, once you've got the ability to understand your universe, once you have the curiosity to go and visit other places, then my sense is that you can cover the galaxy. Well, at the speed of light, it takes 100,000 years. Yes. So let's multiply that by 100. That's almost instantaneous. So I think there's a small problem. They should be there. Apparently, we haven't heard anything. Of course, if we were contacted, it could be about something we wouldn't recognise as being intelligent. Uh, well, it, it depends what you mean by intelligence, yes. but there's, <laughs> there's some clues, even on this planet, in particular there's a very, very intelligent group of birds, the crows, and especially a marvellous one called yes. the New Caledonian Crow, and to the first approximation, they seem to have an intelligence which is very similar to the chimpanzee, but the trick is that the brain structure inside the yes. crow head is completely different from our brain structure or that of a chimpanzee and yet they are still coming out with more or less the same sort of mentality. If they are there, can we contact them and if so how? The radio is the favoured method but of course I think you have other ideas Simon. Well uh, the problem with radio telescopes in a sense is that a great deal of energy is needed to transmit a much cheaper way, which is largely a result of the technology of lasers, suggests that you can effectively build lighthouses, beacons, which have incredibly bright pulses of light, very, very short, but brighter than any star. Now, you can begin to advertise yourself and say there's a natural phenomenon, maybe a supernova, then that civilization immediately broadcasts and says, effectively, we have seen that supernova, we are now drawing attention to ourselves. So this idea of what's called optical SETI, optical search for extraterrestrial intelligence, is probably the main player on the block at the moment, yes. But of course, there are still some people who believe we really are totally alone in the universe and there's no other life anywhere. What do you think about that? That is still a possibility, because it is just possible that the evolution of life itself is much more difficult than we realise. It is just possible that the Earth is a much rarer planet than we thought. It's just possible the solar system is much, much rarer. It seems incredible, given the size of the universe and the number of galaxies and all the rest of it, that we could be alone. But I think, even from the perspective of imagining what an extraterrestrial visitor might say to us when they hypothetically arrive, they might look at us and say, what are you doing to your planet at the moment? Mm. This is no way to behave mm. at all. Mm. So let us just imagine that the visitor never comes, but we still face our predicaments. Mm. There is a good argument to say, let's pretend we're alone at least, mm. because we cannot be sure that we will be bailed out by some mm. friendly alien. Mm. The way that we're treating our planet at the moment is an atrocious uh, example to any visiting aliens, whether they be friendly or unfriendly, you know, these hypothetical aliens. I, I really feel that we have to be better stewards of our own planet so that we can go out and explore beyond our planet and our solar system with a, a clear conscience. I just wonder, is it going to happen? Well, if so, what would you say if you suddenly met um, a man who came down the spacecraft. If he happened to arrive in, uh, in my back garden in Cambridge, I would say, uh, it's okay, uh, we'll contact people in a moment, but come inside, come and have a gin and tonic, <laughs> and uh, come and listen to this music. What do you think of it? Yeah. I would say, good afternoon, nice to see you. Will you please come with me now to the nearest television studio and join me on the Sky at Night programme? <laughs> if that happens, I hope you'll be there too. <laughs> Monica, Simon, thank you so much.